for the first seven months of this fiscal year, if you annualize the reductions, the agencies have been told to reduce by something over 4%. Now, monthly we uh, allocate our funds, so it's pretty tough, but the first few months of the year, they were they rece received their full allocation. So annualized, it's 4%. You know, the Christmas season was supposed to be a great saver for the state as far as revenues go. Do, is this just the bearer of more bad tidings that maybe even Oklahomans are tightening their belts and we won't have that growth in revenue? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's not a good sign, but uh, these do not reflect the basic Christmas sales. Those will come in the February allocations. State revenues are really no lower than they were last year. They are only lower than what state agencies had planned for. The House Education Committee will be trying to help state schools readjust their expectations without harming the quality of their product. But one of the first orders of business today was educating new members of the legislature. One dramatic example of the revenue change is a comparison of new money available now with new money spent last year just in teacher salaries. $100 million went just into salaries for common education, uh, support personnel, and teachers. This year, starting out, we have $11 million for the entire state services. And it's quite a different ball game than what we've had before. Different groups reported how the shortfall of expectations has affected them so far. Regents Chancellor Dr. Joe Leone reports that state universities and colleges made their biggest cutbacks in salaries and equipment. He suggests the schools may help make up the loss of funds by raising the percentage of education students pay for. Leone says students may expect a 10% increase in tuition next year. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the state capitol. The house was all but destroyed, with damage estimated at over half a million dollars. Fortunately, there were no injuries. There was personal loss here, though. About 50 fraternity members will have to relocate for the spring semester. The students began gathering charred and smoke-damaged possessions this afternoon. That process continued tonight as the dark came. Well, I was pretty sorry about it. Hopefully, I was hoping everything was okay, and uh, hoping everything, hope, hopefully we would get something out of it. Everything was really smoke damaged, really bad, and water damaged, but um, uh, they'll be okay, I think. Most of it will be all right. What was your first thought when, when, when you found out about this? It was one of disbelief or shock until I actually got here. I was you know, kind of apprehensive about believing it to begin with, but I did learn. There was just so much smoke in the hallways and, and in the rooms that I couldn't breathe, and so I just had to get out, and so I jumped out the second floor window and got out and, and tried to find out if Todd was still in there. Just where the students who lived here will live now is a big question mark. One of them remarked, we just hope it's together as a group. Dan Slocum, Action 4 in Norman. One of the largest payouts of state funds goes to employee payroll and benefits. When funds are falling and the budgets are being cut, something has to go. The state has promised not to cut individual salaries, but they also promise salaries won't be increased and some positions won't be refilled. Some state employees are mad. They say that by maintaining their present salaries, they are actually being cut. The employees will be losing money when not keeping up with inflation. They will be losing 1% because they must contribute an extra 1% into their retirement program. They will be losing, and I can't give you the exact figure on health care cost, they're going to be losing on an increase in Social Security uh, taxation as well as in other general fields of taxation. So the employees, instead of even trying to keep their head above water, are sinking real fast this year. 
House Budget Chairman Cleta Dethridge says the state will do what they can to ensure employees do not suffer from the standstill. All we can do is make our best effort, and I'm saying that our best effort will be to try to maintain the current compensation. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the State Capitol. Gene Pope is a farmer. In order to support his way of life, he's had to do what so many farmers across the state of Oklahoma have been forced to do, start another business. Pope has been involved in agriculture 30 years. But about six years ago, Pope and his sons felt they needed to do some work on the side in order to subsidize their farming operation. So they started a trucking company. We enjoy farming, but we just can't afford to farm alone right now and not do anything else so we're subsidizing our farming with dirt work. We do all types of dirt work, haul sand and gravel and level pads for houses and any type of dirt work. Just, it's a necessity and uh, it's becoming more so every year. Pope says it's almost impossible for farmers to make ends meet this day and time because of high production cost and low prices for farm products. He feels if agriculture continues to be financially depressed, it won't be long before a full-time farmer is a thing of the past. Ben McCain, Action 4. The problem stems from this parcel of land. The First Southern Baptist Church of Dell City bought it in December 1981. They say Oklahoma City and Midwest City promised to grant building permits, and they broke ground in September. Now Oklahoma City has denied the permit, and Midwest City is remaining mute. The largest Southern Baptist congregation has outgrown their present facilities, and the elders have empowered their attorney to do whatever is necessary to resolve the problem. But they say they don't want to go to court. We just want to get on with our business, which is the serving the community in moral and spiritual ways. And, and at this point in time, we're a little frustrated because we have been blocked from doing that. What we'll do is take it one day at a time, and we will cross bridges and handle problems as we come to them, believing that uh, there won't be any problem presented to us that will be uh, so gigantic that we can't handle it. The Southern Baptists say they are already looking for an alternative site, but they have invested $4 million into the new church and they won't give up easily. Filing a lawsuit will be a last resort. Instead, the church will try to find the answers to why the permits are being denied and try to satisfy the people involved. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, in Dell City. They look at the painting very closely and examine it against the last condition report. There are, there are lighting uh, considerations and atmospheric considerations and all those things together can cause changes.
when the Surgeon General's report came out, there was considerable controversy about whether the correlations that he made between cigarette smoking and health or illness really were, really were valid. Statisticians have helped confirm that. More investigation has been done. And really, there's more data available than ever that cigarette smoking is harmful to your health. Increased risk of heart attack, increased risk of a half dozen different kinds of cancer from the bladder to the larynx, lung and larynx being the ones of the greatest. Small increased risk of uh, stroke. Just, it, just much more firm information than we had before. Don't few employees that came in brought in whole sacks from their cupboards at home. They weren't bringing in just one and two cans, so that shows that, uh, that the people that had the early word are really starting to participate. We expect the program to run about eight weeks, and we expect to have over 15 to 20,000 cans, plus some cash contributions from our employees here at work. I'm Officer Bill Hanneman. On January 1st at approximately 6.50 p.m., the Delaney Warehouse, located at Northwest 44th and Cooper, was burglarized by two black male suspects. The scenes you are about to see were made by a security video camera of the actual burglary. This is not a reenactment. After prying open the front door, the security camera was activated. It recorded a black male who quickly entered the building and picked up a litten microwave oven. As he leaves, a second black male enters and steals another microwave oven. The two men then re-entered the building, one stealing a 25-inch RCA color TV, while the second burglar steals a third microwave oven. These burglars took exactly 32 seconds to steal over $1,500 worth of property. Last year, over 13,000 residential and business burglaries were reported in the Oklahoma City area. These burglaries affect every citizen in our community. If you have any information about this burglary or any crime in the Oklahoma City area, call Crime Stoppers at 235-7300. All callers will remain anonymous. You could earn a reward of up to $1,000, and you will be a Crime Stopper. During the past four and a half hours, parts of the state have been blanketed with more than two inches of snow. Central and western Oklahoma are two of the hardest hit areas. Motorists in Oklahoma City have been challenged by old man winter. The snow has created slick and hazardous driving conditions, even for drivers of heavy equipment. This tractor slid across the road and into a ditch. Police and street sanding crews have been busy since noon, clearing car wrecks and ice off the roadways. But despite the sand and salt on many streets and bridges, there have been pileups around the city. This three-car wreck at 50th and May was a familiar sight. Police report more than 100 fender benders around the city since noon. Police are urging motorists to slow down and drive with extra caution. Debbie Mash, Action 4. that I will ask for a complete audit of, of that agency. With that, Governor Nye made it official. 
The controversial State Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs will be thoroughly audited by the new state auditor and inspector. The news came after the Daily Oklahoman released a copyright story this morning stating former auditor Tom Daxon said he could not complete an audit of the Bureau because financial records were missing, incomplete, or altered. The Bureau came under fire in November when Governor Nye ordered an OSBI investigation into alleged financial mismanagement. On November 24th, the day the OSBI completed their investigation, Bureau Director Warren Henderson resigned. Daxon, in a letter sent to some state officials, cites some irregularities and possible illegal activity within the Bureau. Daxon's successor, Clifton Scott, hopes the new audit will answer some of the questions raised by the letter. Well, I, I think by the fact that they have uh, occurred, or that they are questions now, that we should uh, at least uh, satisfy the need to answer them at least. Or to answer them, yes. The audit is priority one for the new auditors, and will be started immediately. There is already a preliminary study underway to decide the best way to approach the assignment. Meanwhile, spokesmen at the Bureau are remaining silent on the issue. They claim the auditors are only halfway in through their investigation, and they won't make a comment until the audit is completed. Kevin Ogle, Action 4, at the Bureau of Dangerous Drugs and Narcotics. I'm not supposed to say anything. Just wait and see. This isn't, this isn't a cut and dry deal this time. In Oklahoma, you want to elaborate on that? Why? In a nutshell. Simply, the person is unable to separate out the information that they already have about the county commissioner system and county commissioners in general from the information they'll hear during the trial itself. It all become one source of information because they belong to a very designatable group that has high visibility and the boundaries of that group membership are clearly stated by holding a public office. If a woman is given all of her alternatives, if she's given all the facts, then the majority of them will not seek to have an abortion. I think women have been made victims and that they need a lot of support. Last month, a needed couple faced manslaughter charges in the death of their son. The boy had died from appendicitis after the parents' religious beliefs had led them to seek an answer in prayer instead of simple medicine. The parents were acquitted of any wrongdoing based on a section of the Child Care Act listing religious exemptions. Now, members of the House Criminal Justice Committee want to remove that exemption, and today they heard from members of the family's church, the Church of the Firstborn. Elders said this is a question of religious right and family sovereignty. We don't think that's fair. We think it's against your constitutional rights 
and we object to the way 1082 is now worded. We give the best care possible to our children. I think it would be fair to tell Mr. Lewis, this committee, that if the law changes and it's a felony for us to not take our children to the doctor, rest assured we won't take our children to the doctor. Our doctrine will not change. I've got a minor child, and if I go to prison, I'll go to prison. Representative Don McCorkle agrees constitutional rights are involved, but he says the rights to be protected belong to the child, not the parents. And I quite honestly simply cannot accept a concept that would say at some point in time, prior to a child being born, that he has a right to life that ought to be protected by the state, but that after he is born, that protection of the state for that life ceases and desists if that parent happens to have a faith which would disallow that protection. Most of the legislators were sympathetic towards the church people. They said they didn't doubt the parents' concern for the physical and spiritual well-being of their children. But the committee approved the removal of the exemption by a 12 to 2 margin. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the state capitol. My major objection to what he had to say was uh, uh, calling for the contingency fees. Uh, part of that would be a $5 per barrel tax on domestic production, which I think would be very counterproductive to an industry that's already hurting right now in, in the state of Oklahoma and is paying more tax than any other industry in the United States. I think there are enough companies now that are having a difficult time to get getting by that an additional $5 hike in the tax on oil may put them over the edge. I think people are very, very concerned about it. Anytime you're losing money, you're going to be concerned, but I still got to feed my family and I got to keep working to do that. I think there's too many of them out there hungry. I don't think they will. If they do, it won't be very long. When the case began, Judge Luther Eubanks said the trial may have to be moved, but he wanted to try to seat an impartial jury. For almost three hours, Eubanks questioned the jury panel. Fourteen were excused because they had preconceived notions about the case. Six were excused for other reasons. Finally, a ten-woman, two-man jury was seated. In his opening statement, U.S. Attorney Bill Price said he would present five witnesses who would testify they paid kickbacks to Adair. Four have pled guilty for their activities. Price said it was standard procedure for these men to pay Adair a 10% kickback on equipment he purchased for District 1 in Oklahoma County. Price said he would also show that Adair got a 10% kickback when he sold his district's used equipment. The prosecution also intends to prove Adair is guilty of mail fraud,
tax evasion and perjury. Adair's attorney said the witnesses the prosecution would call did indeed pay kickbacks, but Andy Coates said the men didn't pay kickbacks to his client. Coates said the prosecution's main witness would be a supplier, Guy Moore. Coates called Moore a terrible, terrible liar. He said Moore had lied a thousand times. There were fewer 18-wheelers on Oklahoma highways today. The strike itself is not keeping truckers off the road, but rather the fear of violence. Many of the independent truckers say they sympathize with what the strike is all about, but say the fight should have been before the highway use tax was voted on. At one Oklahoma City truck stop, it looked like business as usual. Many of these truckers were involved in a trucker's strike a few years ago, and the end result of that strike didn't help their cause much. One truck stop employee can't tell there's even a strike going on. Pat, there's supposed to be a trucker strike going on right now. Is there one as far as you're concerned? Not from my position, no. Can't really tell one this afternoon at all. Been pretty busy here. <laughs> Several truckers say they are still on the road because surviving outweighs striking. It scares, scares the hell out of me. But what, you know, what can we do about it? I drive for an outfit, and they tell me that if I don't sit in the seat of it and drive it down the road, somebody else will. So, you know, what are we going to do? Well, I got payments to make and all, and can't make a living just sitting around. I don't know what else to do right now. Many of the truckers we talked with expect the current strike to accomplish no more than blowing off steam. One trucker says unless the government cooperates with independence more in the future, the next strike may see coast-to-coast -coast violence. Ed Stewart, Action 4. Fred Henshawn, like many other independent truckers, has decided to park his rig for a while. The striking truckers are angry. Angry about the high price of doing business on the nation's highways. Henshawn spends most of his time at home these days, staying with his family and talking about the strike. The feelings run deep, and Henshawn warns that things could get sticky. Most of the trucks that are running are, are doing it with the hopes of making a big profit out of this strike. There's too many truckers out here that are going bankrupt, and they've pulled their trucks off the road to try to get it back where they can make a living. And someone else goes out and tries to make a quick buck today at their expense. They're not dealing with the air controllers this time. They're dealing with truck drivers, and they're a different breed of cat. He's been in trucking for 20 years. He'll have to try to find something else to do. We may have to start selling things. This may happen in three weeks, four weeks, I don't know. Ironically, the five cent a gallon gasoline hike is the least of their problems, according to Henshawn. But they do want a rollback on all highway taxes. They claim they're being taxed out of existence. Henshawn talks of truckers who haven't been home in five months for fear of their vehicle being repossessed. And he warns that it could be a long and violent strike before the issue is resolved. Kevin Ogle, Action 4.
there are 270-something breeders of us here in Oklahoma wanting to uh, help uh, promote greyhound racing in the state. Uh, we think that it would be beneficial, bring in, uh, you know, e equal amount of revenue to the state as horse racing. And um, we uh, are, quite frankly, tired of sending our dogs out of state and letting the other states earn the revenue. Besides, we only uh, collect 35% on our dogs that we have to lease out to other states.